Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is our lecture 39 in high dimensional probability in data science. This is our last week, and I thought it would be a good time uh, for us in the last three lectures to, um, to catch up on some tools, on more tools in high dimension, mathematical tools in high dimensional probability that are widely applicable in data science that like everyone who works in the theoretical foundations of data science should know and, and it's very popular and everybody uses them and so the tools that are transferable that you can just take from here and apply somewhere else for example for the first two classes these tools will be related to stochastic processes You have seen some of stochastic processes before. You probably know a little bit about Brownian motion as a as a canonical stoch stochastic process that is Gaussian. Yeah, we have seen stochastic, we have seen empirical processes already. But today we will be working in a wide generality. We'll just consider any um, for the beginning. Let's consider any Gaussian process. Gaussian stochastic process xt. This simply means that each for each t, xt is a is a any normal random variable, and this capital T is is any index set, any set really. So it's just a collection of normal random variables, possibly correlated. That's where things become interesting. T is an arbitrary set, could be finite, could be infinite. The, although this is a very general situation, very general object, we can already at this general level look at this process geometrically. And this is very interesting, I'll show you how. So we'll introduce geometry now. Uh, the process, it's so T, the set T is completely arbitrary. It lacks any geometrical structure so far, but we can put geometry in a canonical way. So this process induces a metric on T. Let's just define the distance between two points by looking at X T minus X S. This is called the increment. Both are random variables, so there are norms associated with them. For example, the L2 norm. And if you remember what L2 norm is, it's just expected value of xt minus xs squared. And then you take the square root. That's the definition of the L2 norm. Because the L2 norm is really a norm, it's really a metric, it satisfies triangle inequality. As a result, this will be a distance, D of T. It, it induces a distance, a metric on T of S. It does satisfy triangle inequality. Agreed? Okay, so this is a, it's a trivial thing, but it's a miracle. Now, now T is automatically a metric space. There is automatically some geometry on T. Let's explore this a little bit on, on specific examples. Let's say we have Brownian motion. And you tell me, guys, you, have you studied Brownian motion a little bit in probability theory? No? In stochastic processes. Oh, stochastic, yeah. Those of you who have, who have taken stochastic processes, definitely, yeah. Uh, have you all taken stochastic processes or not? No? Not all, all of us, I guess. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm, yeah. Def yeah, definitely statisti uh, statistics and uh, some of mathematicians, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Okay. So if you know Brownian motion, great. If you don't know Brownian motion, it's a process. Let me briefly tell you what it is. Uh, it's a process with on the real line, uh, on the positive line, zero to infinity. T is time. And the increments, it can be defined as the process with continuous paths whose increments bt minus bs are independent 
normal have mean zero and variance t minus s. I put absolute value so that works for any t of s. Okay, so that's a definition basically of the Brownian motion. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yes, Vladislav, go ahead. Uh, so, just to clarify, uh, in uh, the stochastic uh, calculus course, uh, I heard that uh, dt minus bs, bs minus bs1, bs1 minus bs2, etc., etc., have to be independent, but not, for example, b2 minus b1 and b3 over 2 minus b1 over 2. Yeah, if they're overlapping, they're not independent, yeah. Yeah, it's important to uh, ah. notice. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, when I right, thanks, Vladislav. It's a yeah, Brownian motion is a process with increments that are independent with non-overlapping increments that are independent. So if you have increments like this, t one s one, and then t one s one, these increments will be independent. But if you have increments like this, they're obviously not they will be independent. So Brownian motion does what it wants. Uh, on over independent over in over non overlapping increments. Yes, that's a that's a good catch. And the variance increases as we can see as t go as t increases variance increases. That means that that Brownian motion um, kind of generally deviates farther and farther from the mean at the at the rate square root of t. If, just put s to be zero for it for a moment. Then you have the variance will be t, and so the standard deviation will be root t, and so the very this Brownian motion will be approximately root t. So that's Brownian motion. Um, okay. So what's the metric? What is this metric for the Brownian motion? Well, it's obvious. Uh, the metric uh, d of t s, according to this, is just the L2, it's, so we need to square this. That means the variance of Bt minus Bs, it's root of T minus S. And then we take the square root. So it's gonna be square root of T minus S in absolute value. It's a very weird metric. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's metric on the real line, on reals. It's distance on the reals that is not the, the usual distance. It's even surprising that it satisfies triangular inequality, maybe, but, but it is a distance. Funny one. We'll come back to this example later. Any Gaussian process that you may know does the same, such as Brownian. Uh, sorry, for any Gaussian process, you can define this metric for the Brownian bridge where you start Brownian motion, you pin it down at two points and then, the, and then let the Brownian motion run, but required to come back at some point, let's say at, at zero one uh, for the fractional Brownian motion, uh, for Brownian sheet, for Gaussian free field and so on and so forth. All, all of these processes that are Gaussian, you can do the same thing. You can define the distance uh, on, on T. Another example, a simpler example, is where xt is just gt, where g is one normal random variable and t is, uh, let's say, reals. And xt minus xs is g times t minus s, which is normally distributed, means mean zero and variance t minus s squared. So in this case, the distance is the actual, the, 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 the classical distance on R. Okay. The last example, it was square root and now it's, there is no square root. Now it's more familiar distance. On R. One more example, a high dimensional example would be just recycle this GT, but make it high dimensional, make it the inner product like this GT, where G is the standard normal in dimension D and, and T belongs to RD. So it's a 
now it's not now t is not time t is a some high dimensional set and it's easy to check just like we did in the last example that the distance will again be the classical Euclidean distance on RD in this case. So this is a non-surprising example. And the, so this is this is an example. The, the first idea is to take, if you want to handle a, a, a Gaussian process indexed by some set T, completely arbitrary abstract set T, you can always induce a metric on T and think of T as, as being a, a, a geometric structure. This is how it will be fruitful. Let's set ourselves a goal. What do we want about this process to compute? We would like, we would, would, be, would compute in this couple classes, the largest, the largest value the process can ever take. E is in T. For example, for the Brownian motion, if, if it models the stock price, for example, it will model the uh, largest value, the, 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 the highest value the stock can take within one day, let's say, or within one year. Or build the smallest value by the symmetry, for example. We can do the same. It can also, if, if this Gaussian process models some risk of something, some failure of equipment or something like this, it will model the highest risk over the lifetime of the equipment, something. So suppose we want to do that. And we will now, we will do this using the geometry, a geometric approach, using the geometry of the metric space TD. We we'll now have the metric. T is a geometric structure. And we will use the geometry specifically, namely, we will use the covering numbers. <clears throat> N, T, D, epsilon. And we have studied them before, but let me remind you what they are. We take T. Suppose it's this pentagon, for example, that's our T. We take a ball of radius epsilon. It's not necessarily a round ball. The metric can be arbitrary, but for the sake of this illustration, let it be round. And then we, with this ball, we cover, we try to cover T with the copies of this ball, just like I'm doing here. The smallest number of these balls that needed that cover T is called the covering number. Remember? Yeah. In this case, I just proved by picture that the covering number is at most one, two, three, four, five, six. So NTD epsilon is the smallest cardinality. of an epsilon net of TD, which is the smallest, the same as smallest number of epsilon balls that cover T. Uh, may I ask a question, and what is D in this context? Is it D-dimensional random vectors? For uh, no, 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 it's, it's the confusion with dimension. D in this context is the canonical metric. So this is, this is how we define the metric on the on T. Yeah, it is in the, it's important to to know that for the rest of this discussion. What D is, D is the metric that we induced on T. This metric encodes the process itself somehow. The Gaussian process. If you know a little bit more about Gaussian process, you know that they are determined by the covariance structure. The covariance structure is encoded in the Euclidean norm like this. The Euclidean norm and, uh, determines the metric. And so the geometry of T captures somehow the probability, the, the, the geometric structure of T captures the probabilistic structure of the random process. That's an that's a idea, to turn, to turn probability into geometry. So we define this metric D, and with that metric, we cover T. The examples of that metric, we just 
so that this is not too abstract. The examples of this metric we just covered. So three examples. Any other questions? Good. Good. Okay, so now we're ready for the results. A beautiful and extremely useful result is Dudley's, uh, Dudley's inequality. Uh, 1967, something like that. That says that for any mean zero, let's say, let's have all of these random variables have mean zero for simplicity. Any mean zero Gaussian process satisfies the following. So this is our bound. X t is less than or equal to some constant, absolute constant. I don't remember exactly what it is. Something like 20. And then there is an integral, integral of discovering numbers with respect to the scale epsilon. Looks strange. <laughs> it's not really obvious that it's easy to compute. <laughs> it's not obvious that it is easy to compute. Well, we'll com yeah, that's right. Um, we'll try to compute it in some cases. And that will be this class and, and the next class where we'll study how to compute this in some very non trivial examples. For this, you don't need to compute it exactly. Uh, some bound usually suffices, but yeah, it's not obvious. So this is the result. Is anything? Is anything? Everything clear about these results? Kind of right. Okay. So what does it really say? Log of the covering number. It's called the metric entropy of t at this scale. At the scale. Of t. Um, it's um, it's related to coding, really. It's how many bits you need to encode T in a computer with accuracy epsilon. Because it's, a, it's a, how many balls you put, so you can encode T with the center of that ball and the accuracy is epsilon. So that's, um, that's kind of a coding complexity of T. The important thing here, and that's what makes it a little strange, is this integral. It suggests that the right hand side the bound is multi-scale it's not just we take the we cover t with one scale just with, with balls of radius epsilon compute how many and that gives us the answer no we need to do this for many many epsilons and take the integral so it suggests that that the whole thing this question is a multi-scale question a question about multi-scale geometry of t maybe even fractal geometry of t something like that and the proof of this yeah. result that we will give in a second um, really explores that. It's a multi-scale, the proof itself will be a multi-scale version of our familiar epsilon net argument. And this is called chaining. It's a new tool and that is exactly the reason why we're uh, studying this maybe not just for the result but for the for the proof that is widely applicable and then probably a new tool for you so this is so you need to pay attention now to the proof because that's that's why i'm bringing this up okay so it, it will be a multi-scale approximation so we set how do we do this we first set the scales um define this the scale multi-scales actually Epsilon, uh, we'll do a discrete version of this. So the, the scales will be, let's say, decaying exponentially. And so on. Then we will choose epsilon nets, actually, epsilon k nets. So we cover T 
with balls of radius epsilon k. And this is how many balls we need in, for, e, for each covering. That's just a definition. Okay, so we do this covering on many, many scales. Just without loss of generality and for simplicity, let's assume that the first, that the diameter of T is bounded by one. So we can make the first, the, the coarsest scale, the coarsest covering consists of just one point. If the diameter is less than one, you can cover the entire T by one ball. And that's, let's call it T zero. Okay, so we did this. This is multi-scale covering. And by just by definition of the net implies that for any T, any T can be approximated by a TK with accuracy at most epsilon K. Agreed? This is how we set the scale. Yeah, so T is covered by these balls. It means that every T is within epsilon K from the center, and that's that's what it is. Okay, nothing happened so far. We just set up the, the picture, but this is the most important thing. This is a setup of chaining. So here, suppose I'm, I'm suppose this is T zero. It's a fixed point, T zero. And our goal is to bound this uniformly. So suppose I want to bound xt for some t. So imagine that like we are sitting over here. We're, we're somewhere here at t. And we will find a path, a chain of links from t0 to t in the following way. We first approximate t0. Uh, we, sorry, we first approximate T by T1 as best as we can, then by T2, then by T3, then by T4, and so on. Each time the approximation is better and better. Epsilon K grows exponentially. And so we will be, we'll be maybe closing down on, to, on T. We will be converging onto T. Let's make that explicit. Let's think of this as we, as a walk. The walk that we make from T0, a fixed point, to any point T in the set. Possibly infinitely many steps. We can make that walk, that chain for any T. So explicitly, it looks like this, x, x, t0 minus xt. We can make this walk by a telescoping sum, xt1 minus xt2, and et cetera. Until we, at the end of the time, probably somewhere, we converge to xt. Agreed? Okay, this is the most important step, actually, the proof. It's, it's kind of trivial, but it's... Okay. Good. So then we can just use triangle inequality to bound each, each link in this chain. So we have a sum. Bound this as, as by a sum. X T K minus one, I think, minus X T K, just like that. And the question is, how do we bound each link in this chain? Okay, let's do it. What do we know about the distances between these two points, between tk minus one and tk? Well, we know that one is approximating 
tk minus one approximates t and t approx and tk approximates t. So this is again by triangle inequality for this metric for this distance we can write that. We know the quality of these approximations. Here we are. This is, this is a quality. This is how well we approximate. So one approximates with epsilon k minus one, the other is epsilon k. Right? Okay. And epsilon k was, we set epsilon k as two to the minus k. So this is two to the minus k, this is two to the minus k minus one, uh, plus one. So this I believe would be less, it actually equals to three epsilon k. Okay. Good, so this is the distance between the, we computed the distance between these two points. It's, it happens to be less than three epsilon k, but the distance controls the increments. That's uh, that's that that is our our idea. Okay, so to do that, let's then take the in this inequality again crucial step. Take the supremum over t on both sides, and then expected value. Then expectation. So we'll get expected value of uh, the supremum of t over t. Okay, we can push expected value inside, of course. Expected value. And here we'll take the supremum inside here. So supremum of x tk minus one minus x tk. So what are these? What, what are these points that we're taking supremum of? U is tk minus one. So U is in tk minus one. V is in tk. I'm just renaming tk minus one tk. And we just proved that the distance between them is less than three epsilon k. Okay. This is almost what I want to what we want to bound. We don't we will get rid of xt0 lately, but this is almost what we want to bound. The supreme over all t. And we bounded it by taking this expected value, which we can call, let's call it something. Let's call the set of this u, the set of pairs uv. Let's call this pk, the set of pairs. It's a finite set. Okay, the rest of the proof will be now simpler, but I want to make sure that you guys totally understand what's what's going on here. No, you don't understand. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, it's not clear the equivalency. Like this whole chain of T Ks, they depend on the T, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. So T establishes the whole chain. And now yeah. we, uh, under, under expectation, we have the supremum over set that does not... Mm, yeah, that's a good, okay. Yeah, maybe I was too, too fast on this. Um, right, so we have a set, let's actually make this even explicit. Maybe don't write this down, but all this T0, T1, T2, they all they all depend on T, very true. Right? This chain really depends, it's, they, these are approximations to T, so definitely the chain uh, depends on T. So here, everything depends on T, like in the right-hand side. But the observation is this, although they depend on T, they are not free anywhere. There are some constraints. What are they? TK minus one, this one, these points, they are in TK. TK minus, they're in, okay, TK minus ones are in this set, and this set is finite. TK, is in this set, it's also finite. And the distance between them is three epsilon k. 
So now I am enlarging the, 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 the supremum and I'm including all possible points with these constraints. Now okay, they there is an inequality. I missed the inequality. Okay. Inequality, yes, yes. So this is what is going on here. Although here it depends on T, they're not completely arbitrary points. One is in one set, the other in the other set, and the distance between them is less than three epsilon k. So now I'm taking the supreme or all possible pairs like that. All possible pairs. These don't, this set doesn't depend on T anymore. But this is a, the most kind of difficult part of this proof. I wanted you guys that you understand. Pablo already understand. Anybody else um, have any questions about it? The logic is clear. Yeah. On the right hand side, there was dependence on T. We removed it by including all possible pairs like this. Perfect. And we call this set of pairs PK. Great. The rest, I promise, will be simpler because now the problem, uh, the problem just reduced to take the maximum. It's actually a maximum. It's it's a finite set. So instead of putting supremum, I can put max to control the maximum of sub Gaussian random variables x u minus x x b over a finite set. We did this. This was one of our homework problems. So we'll use homework five, problem five, where we did exactly this problem. This was maximum of sub-Gaussians. Um, I'll, I'll just put it in, in the convenient form here. For any normal random variables, zi, these will be these variables shortly. For any normal random variable zi's with mean zero, variance less than something whose all variances are less than something we have expected value of the maximum of n of them scale like root of log n that's the most important thing maximum over n gaussians is about root log n it doesn't grow very fast that's because of the con tight concentration And so we use it, we will apply this result for, um, for the i b x u minus x v for these random variables. We have maximum over this many random variables, normal random variables was mean zero by assumption mean zero. So we get This is less than, okay, now let's remember what the, um, ah, let's see, I have to make sure that they are, that, they, uh, that these are variants, have good variants. So these random variables have mean zero by assumption and variance, actually standard deviation. I should have said standard deviation, sorry guys, all the time here. Standard variance is sigma squared, standard deviation is sigma. So the standard deviation of them is duv. That's how we defined d. Remember, in the first place, that's how we induce the metric by, by making the standard deviation of this. So the standard deviation is less than three epsilon k right there. Okay, so now we are. Now we're applying this problem, it's less than, let me just hide the absolute constant by taking this less than sigma, which is three epsilon k times root of log n. In this case, n is the cardinality of pk. Good. Okay, what's pk? It's a set of pairs. At most, it has the cardinality. At most, it has the cardinality t k times t k minus one. Yeah, it's a set of some pairs from u is from t k minus one, v is from t k. So the set of pairs at most has this many, this cardinality t k grows because this, as the scale 
gets smaller, the, the epsilon net, the number of covering, we need more and more balls, so it grows. So it's less than gk squared like this. The logarithm will kill the square. So we get logarithm of, of gk. Perfect, this is wonderful. So we just take this and we put it down there instead of the epsilon. That's it, we're almost done. So the expected value of this supremum. Xg is less than, up to the absolute constant, is less than sum epsilon k square root log of gk. That's the result. Now in the rest of the proof, we'll manipulate it into the integral in, in that least inequality, but that will be kind of boring. But the, the most important thing is has already happened. The most important thing is to make the chaining like this and estimate each, each link of that chain separately. So we did that. Far so good? Okay, so now let's let, now let's go and try to manipulate this in a, to, into a more convenient form. Let's remember what these epsilon k's were. They were two to the minus k. That's how we set up the scale, two to the minus k. And what's tk? There are epsilon nets of this cardinality. That's how we chose them. Yeah, we chose each tk as epsilon net of that cardinality, and we have this long sum. Now, the rest of this is just say, okay, hey, hey, we have this long sum. Let's interpret this as a Riemann sum of the integral. Um, and this is how. So let's interpret this as a Riemann sum of the integral by setting this, by interpreting this two to the minus k as a chunk, as a little chunk of this integral from, from two to the minus k minus one to two to the minus k d epsilon epsilon to the minus k in this integral epsilon to the minus k will be greater than uh, epsilon to the minus k that's two to the minus k it's greater than epsilon i believe yeah epsilon is smaller than this okay so the epsilon to the minus k is big scale. Therefore, we need less balls to cover it. So this is less than log n t d epsilon. Okay. I'm just doing this boring computation to convert the Riemann sum into the integral, basically. Uh, and this this gets to the integral. So this gets us to the sum of these little integrals of the same term. And if you sum them up, put them together, you cover the entire the entire uh, real positive part of real line. Sum these integrals over all k. So the integral square root of log n t d epsilon d epsilon. Good. That's very good. This is a Dudley's integral on the right hand side. Uh, can I have a question? Yes, Denise, go ahead. In the end, it's like integral from one to one half, from one mm. half to one fourth, and mm. why is there infinity? I'm confused. Ah, yes, uh, right. This is the integral from, from zero to one. Yes. Now, we made the assumption in the very beginning, just a simplifying assumption, 
that the diameter of t is less than one. And so the first scale is, is one. And that's what's showing up here. It's uh, one is actually this diameter of t. So in general, when we don't make that assumption, you will have some other number there, which is a diameter. And because we do not want to know anything about the diameter, don't want to assume anything, we just put infinity there. Is this a convincing argument? No? OK. <laughs> Let's, the, the integral, yes. You're, so the, the, um, the, the actual result, if, if you like, let's correct this with Dudley, will be we're only integrating up to the diameter of t in here, which is kind of clear. If, if, epsilon, if epsilon is larger than the diameter, then you just one point. So n, this covering number is one. You take log of one, you get zero. So this means that beyond the diameter, the terms will be zero automatically. And that's why we do not want to explicitly mention diameter here, but write infinity here like this. But in the proof, we get, we get the diameter, which in this case was one. Yeah, good catch. Any other questions? We also yeah. haven't uh, got rid of the x d zero there under under the superome. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't finished yet. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to get rid of it. Let's get rid of x t zero. Our goal is to just bound x t and and get rid of that that term x t zero. That that's super simple. Um, if you just want to to have to leave it alone, if you just want the expectation of this without t0. Remember that we assumed that the process has mean zero. So we can artificially put it there like this. That's because the term is just zero. I'm just putting artificial zero there. And then pull out the expectation by Jensen's inequality. So it becomes less than expected value of supremum xt minus xt0. Uh, and that we bounded by, by here. So now we just need to take expectation on both sides with respect to xt, and we're done. We prove the result. Good. You want to spend a little bit more time offline on this, just, just do it because this argument is a little technical, but it is really simple. The idea is very simple. The idea is there. Usually in the epsilon net argument, you just find one scale. So basically you approximate T with whatever, it's T, TK with T3, for example, and you stop there and you pay this. So when you approximate T by T3, let's say, you pay the error. The error is two to the is epsilon three, so it's two to the minus three, one eighth, and that one error is just fixed error that's added to your probability bound. Now we made something smarter. We we can we approximate t not with one t k, but with a chain that converges to t. So we don't pay any error actually, because the chain converges to t. It's a multi-scale multi scale approximation argument. Good. Okay, perfect. We got this result. Wonderful result. We will work with it now. It's Dudley inequality, this one. Like this. Let's test it. Let's test it on the Brownian motion. Let's see what it gives. Example. Brownian motion. We have BT. Let's run it on, to, on some intro until t days. Just zero to, to, to ta, let's say ta, tau. So we run the Brownian motion, t days. 
and we're interested in the maximum value that can take the maximum value of the stock over t days tau, tau days sorry okay let's just literally apply that list and equality compute them for that we need to compute the uh the uh, covering numbers let's do it so the metric as we discussed is square root of t minus s with that metric the diameter of our index set this is our this is our index set t the diameter of the index set is uh, well, obviously root tau yeah you agree every point is within usual distance tau from the uh, the, the usual diameter is tau and this with this non-standard metric the induced metric is square root of that it just take literally takes square root okay let's make an epsilon net for each epsilon make the epsilon net of the interval well what, what's the suggestion what what shall we do how do we discretize the interval in the best way by equal intervals yeah yeah well, what intervals can you do right just just do that yeah yeah just exactly so this is our epsilon net we need to make sure that it is an epsilon net. So if I, um, for the net, for the usual metric, we would take epsilon, but for this metric, we need to take root epsilon because it always takes the square root. No, it's like, sorry, for this metric, we have to take epsilon squared like this. Right, so if the usual distance between two points is epsilon squared, then the induced distance is root of epsilon squared, which is epsilon, which is what we need. So this is one over this is this should be uh, epsilon squared. This is two epsilon squared, and so on and so forth, which means that the cardinality of this epsilon net is how many points do we need? T tau over epsilon squared. Good. The points are distance epsilon. The total distance is tau. So we divide one by the other. We get this. How many points? This is for any uh, for any epsilon less than root tau, and for any epsilon that's larger than root tau, the, the the diameter is root tau. So we just need one point. So here is a. Here's our result. Yeah, this is how we compute the. Either we have the epsilon net with these small points, or we just have one point that approximates everything. Perfect. So let's compute the Dudley integral. Log n t d epsilon d epsilon. So far so good, clear? Okay, let's do it. First of all, the integral is really up to root tau. Is that clear? Because if epsilon is greater than root tau, the cardinality will be equal to one, log of one is zero, and the terms just vanish there. So the integral is non-trivial up to tau, and then it is just zero. So we don't need to include that part. And here we have log of tau over epsilon squared d epsilon. Yeah. Okay, let's now change variables to make it simpler. Let's see. Our epsilon squared. So maybe epsilon will be x root tau uh yeah that will that will make this in I, I just wanted to have the integral that's log of one over epsilon squared really or one over x squared dx and because of the change of variable i need to multiply by root tau here yeah the square does doesn't do anything right this logarithm just kills the square it just 
will become a factor. One over X doesn't do anything either. It just changes the sign. So it's integral of log uh, of X, which is what it's convergent. Yeah, it's converged it's smaller than some constant. Right at zero, there is a singularity, but I think it's integrable singularity. So it's good. So what's the result? The result by Dudley inequality is that the maximum stock price over T days, tau, tau days, is less than C root tau. Which kind of makes sense, I guess. A little bit makes sense because if the Brownian motion does, the, the Brownian motion's um, standard deviation is root tau. So generally it like goes up. This is the scale at which Brownian motion grows. At, TV, at time tau, you expect it to be root tau from the origin, which makes sense. But it doesn't, by any means, it doesn't show that uh, it's always like that. Right. So now we prove that it's always like that over the entire path. It's bounded by, by this. Over the entire path from zero to tau, it's bounded by root tau up to constant factor. If you studied Brownian motion a little bit, or if you will study the Brownian motion, then this result will not be surprising or not new to you. You can prove it directly. Uh, a direct proof. Oh, sorry, not a direct proof. A, a, a proof via so-called reflection principle. Gives the same. It actually gives the exact number. And the number is root of two over pi. So you can prove that without all this Dudley thing, using other things about Brownian motion. But the proof is rigid. It really applies only to the Brownian motion. It uses the crucial fact, some symmetry of the Brownian motion in a crucial way. Um, and this proof is very flexible. It applies, applies to pretty much anything, like Brownian motion, Brownian bridge, whatever. Any questions? Good, so we have now a general tool. This, this theorem, the theorem, let me show you back. The Dudley's inequality applies to any Gaussian process. In fact, if you trace, your, if you trace our steps back and ask yourself how much of the Gaussian did we apply really? Does it, does it apply to any process? Where did we actually use the Gaussian thing? If you look at this proof, no Gaussian, no Gaussian, here's no Gaussian, nothing. We didn't use any Gaussian. Only here did we use that the, the random variables are normal. But in homework five, in, in, the, in this homework, the, what we really did was for sub-Gaussian random variables. In fact, the problem is called the maximum of sub-Gaussians. So we can redo everything. Everything holds without any change for sub-Gaussian processes. And this is, this is wonderful. And this is what we'll need, for example, next class. So, so the important remark, remark is that the, the proof works not only for Gaussian, but any sub-Gaussian process. Let's, let's state it, xt be any mean zero uh, stochastic process.
And we don't need to exactly tie the metric either for any metric space on any metric space um, whose increments sub Gaussian, this is sub Gaussian norm of the increments are less than something like this. If you go back and trace the steps, that's what we actually used. We used that the sub Gaussian norm is bounded by this metric. Then, then we have the same conclusion. Log t d epsilon d epsilon. So this is general Dudley inequality, which we actually proved. And next time what we'll do, we'll apply it for the empirical, this theorem will apply it for empirical processes and get a new, um, a new way of, of treating empirical processes and the result coming back to machine learning where, where they're needed for empirical risk minimization. If in any future life, you don't even have sub-Gaussian processes, but very, very general, not even sub-Gaussian processes, the, the proof is very flexible. The only place where it uses something about processes is in this homework problem. You just need to be able to compute the expected value of the maximum. And if you can do that, then that's a simple exercise. If you can do this for a, for some distribution, you can just redo the proof for some distribution, and you will you will have root of instead of root log n, you have some other function instead of so this is important instead of square root of log, if you have some other function, then that function will replace square root of log here. That's it. So it's an absolutely general result about bounding any 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 stochastic process at all, a kind of a geometric bound on a stochastic process. And we'll see how it works next time. Any questions? Did they lose you guys? Was it too difficult? No? Mm -hmm. no, not too technical. Well, maybe a little too technical, but if you go home and look at this, it's... chaining is, is, a, is a very natural idea and then, and then just implement it in a technical way a little bit, but that's okay. If I were you, I would ask this question. Is it is this bound sharp in a sense that does does this are this crazy idea about moving probability into into geometry is this the, the optimal idea does this really does, does this geometry really captures all of probability is there a reverse inequality technically is, is this true that there is a reverse inequality here or maybe generally sorry maybe in for gaussian right here for example is that true and unfortunately, it's not true. Uh, and that way, the geometry does not capture exactly all of the probability. So it's not, this idea is almost true. Um, in like 99% of situations that, I, that I've considered, it is true up to a log factor. So you will lose just a log n factor probably somewhere. So feel free to use it if the log is not a problem. But if you need to get rid of log n, then the optimal thing is called uh, is called generic chaining. Generic chaining is an upgrade to a Dudley's and to Dudley's inequality. It's a little complicated upgrade, but it's it's worth it. It's an upgrade to, to Dudley's inequality that gives an an optimal result. It actually says this is what. This this geometry controls the, uh, the the process completely. So this is developed by Telegrand. 
Telegram in 1987. So that's if you need something even sharper than that, but most of the time you probably won't. Good. Any questions? Good. Okay, guys, it was nice to see you as usual. I can't remember who we, uh, let me stop recording now.